Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My guest today is Mitchell Stevens. Hi, Mitch. Hey, Melinda. Great to see you. It's great to see you all the way from New York City. Thanks for joining my my show today. I'm so excited to interview you. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Uh, Mitch Stevens is Professor Emeritus of Journalism and Mass Communications at New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Mitch is also a respected journalist and historian with several original published works. Is that about it? A lot more about you, but that's uh, pretty succinct. So, um, so Mitch, let's start by sharing with my viewers a little bit about growing up in New York City. Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually live right now about eight blocks from where I was born. So all my travels over the years have added up to eight blocks at the moment. Uh, and uh, But I made a suburban trek and I actually went to high school out on Long Island and uh, it was great. You know, we lived uh, a 1950, I had a 1950s childhood where kids could run around and ride bikes and build carts and that sort of thing. Talk to me a little bit about your parents and um your family yeah uh uh my parents were amazing uh, my my dad was a labor union newspaper writer so that's where i got the journalism side and he uh he was very active in the civil rights movement he was on stage during the march on washington he claims to have been the one who made up the number of people who was there when some reporter asked and uh uh, and my mother was a, you know, after not being able to finish school and staying home as a housewife, went on, got her PhD and became a professor of education. So that's where I got the professor's side of my career. Uh, very so, proud of me. So would you say that your parents were the inspiration for you to go into journalism? Yeah. Uh, you know, th we used to discuss what we called then Red China at the table. We were known in the neighborhood as the family that talked about Red China. Uh, so I grew up with current events and news and IF Stones Weekly coming in through the mailbox and uh, and the New York Times, of course, in the house. So, so Red China, I mean, your parents then were progressive liberals and... Tell my, my parents, viewers who might not know what Red China is, what that is. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean they supported Red China necessarily, but no. yeah, my my dad had a had a real left wing background, uh, and uh, and both of them were progressives for their whole lives, always working on causes and planning things, and uh, particularly the civil rights movement. And your father was involved in the labor union, right? The labor union movement. Yeah. Yeah. He was a news, uh, a labor newspaper editor. He was involved in uh, organizing the hospital workers in New York City who were then being paid $60 a week. And how dare they go on a strike? What about the patients, you know? Yeah, well, what about somebody else pay, uh, helping pay for the patient care? Right. So um, so I wanted to, um, to talk a little bit about your role and your involvement in the 60s intellectual revolution that transformed our social democracy, which oftentimes pundits compared to what's going on right now, that, yeah, those 60s people, the, the rebellious ones, the, you know, all this stuff. You were part of that, um, as was I. Talk a little bit about being in New York City and being part of that 60s revolution. Well, it was a, it was a wonderful time to be uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, there was so much going on, and we felt we were reinventing the world with our marijuana and LSD, with our uh, uh, rock and roll in particular, and with our protests against the Vietnam War, which, you know, they were, uh, I would have gotten drafted if I didn't come up with some way of getting out of it. So and 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 everything felt new and kind of wonderful. And as uh, my kids like to point out to me now, it was kind of not that hard to find a job, probably in the end. And uh, things were a little looser. There are a lot fewer people uh, in this country than a lot fewer people in the world. There was more room. 
And uh, I, I like to think I did it in its fullness. I was at Woodstock and at most of the big demonstrations. Well, I remember the demonstrations at Columbia University. I had a professor who came in with literally broken bones and in casts. And I mean, the, the riots in, in New York after Martin Luther King was murdered. And that's when I became an activist was um, it. Uh, and, and would you say that uh, that 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 the 60s revolution really did bring in um, the consciousness around civil rights, women's rights, disability rights? Uh, Earth Day was founded um, around that time in 72. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I certainly was no leader of any of this stuff, but I was, you know, in the crowd and uh, uh, and. I, I think it was important, and I think the world changed, and the world started wearing blue jeans for what it's worth. The world got a lot less form formal, and I think our generation had to do with that. I'm embarrassed the fact by the fact that the boomers nowadays are conservative as a, as a whole, not my friends, but a, a lot of people, uh, and and that some of that spirit is gone or or being taken up by newer newer generations, our children. Right. Well, I certainly was burning my bra. Um, so I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about, um, you received the Distinguished Edward R. Murrow Award for Best Student in Broadcast Journalism from UCLA. That's quite an, that's quite an honor. Yeah, no, that was great. And Edward R. Murrow is a hero of mine. That's uh, right. And, yeah, obviously. And, what was going on at the McCarthy period and what's going on now? Edward R. Murrow. Yeah. Stood up against that. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to commend you for that, that wonderful award. So Mitch, talk to us a little bit about your book, The Rise of the Image, The Fall of the Word, which you wrote in 1998. Um, you stated in the intro in quotes that perhaps we will soon locate our video at sites on the World Wide Web. And seven years later, YouTube was created. That's in quotes, and it's on your Wikipedia page, by the way. Um, today, with life being a series of emojis and text where you don't even spell out words, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, does this make you sad that the importance of words may be declining? What's your, what's your feelings about this? No, in that book, I was more celebrating the image than uh -huh. than mourning the word. I got very, it started in a bathtub in Spain of all places. I got, you know, an idea. People don't have a lot of ideas. That was mine. And the idea was that uh, video, television, we mostly called it in those days, uh, could, could actually be an important intellectual tool artistic but also intellectual and that the secret was not slow serious television which just showed people talking like we're doing now not that that doesn't have its place wonderful to watch people exchange ideas and talk but that there was something beyond that and the idea was based on the fact that uh, print the novel, for example, was once looked down upon as not really an intellectually important tool. And uh, and it took a while for people to really uh, discover the best uses of the printing press. And writing before it had a similar history, uh, all of which I detailed in that book. And my idea, actually, when I went to graduate school, I had that idea in my head, and I was trying to do some experiments with, uh, I guess it was film in those days, not video. Uh, but, uh, and and I, and then when I wrote the book, I did more experiments online. And now that I've sort of done with writing books and done with teaching, I'm trying to do more experiments with that video. And there are a lot of people doing it. I think I was right. There are a lot of people doing videos that are not just somebody talking, but are trying to use this medium, use all the incredible potential of this medium uh, to say things maybe with a fluidity, maybe with a depth, uh, maybe with uh, a reach that, uh, that, may, that print strains for. And that in our conversations, we strain for. So 
So that was my that was my 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 idea, my only. And, and you were idea. ahead of your time. I think I was. I did predict that video would uh, take over the internet, which seems to be happening. I'm so what? So kidding. so what's your take on this whole tear down of TikTok and social media with our kids and older people our age talking about how it's going to destroy? society and humanity and then of course we have the ai which is a whole different conversation but maybe not what what's your take on that of where we are as a society coming down hard on social media and our kids well i think you know i was in a good position to evaluate that because i was you know my parents got their first tv set right about when the average american got their first tv set in about 1955 and I was six years old. And all of that started then. Television was going to turn my wow. brain to mush. It's a vast wasteland. So, you know, when they start saying it about the internet, when they start saying it about TikTok, uh, I, I, I have a very large grain of salt. I am so with you on that. And I can't be that vocal, but my grandkids love the fact that I'm like, come on. I mean, I remember I wasn't, there were shows that I wasn't allowed to watch uh, when I was a kid, but I mean, television was going to be the demise of humanity. Yeah. And um, so here we are again, where the older generation, the boomers are talking about uh, how it's uh, destroying our children's minds. And so I'm really yeah. glad that you and I share that sentiment. And, and you know, and the same mistakes are being made. One of the mistakes was being made about television is in the 1950s and 60s, television was just a baby and people didn't know what to do. And they were imitating movies and theater. I once went and looked at in film, I once counted how many times people in old movies walk through doors. And the reason they walk through doors is because this was imitation theater. And in theater, to get somebody into a scene, you have to go through a door. Well, you don't have to do that in film. And and now we don't need that scene of walking through doors. And I think a lot of what's going on in the Internet today and in, with things like TikTok and, and video, we're still in the uh, walk through door stage. We're still in the imitation stage. We're still taking baby steps. And... Uh, it, it takes longer than we think for a new form of communication to gain its strength. But I do think that we need to, to relax a little bit on this. Um, so I agree with you on that. Um, Mitch, talk to my viewers about your book on atheism, um, Without Gods Toward a History of Disbelief. So I've always considered myself an agnostic atheist, and I don't know if I'm allowed to be one or the other. So I sort of merged them together because I consider myself a spiritualist, but I really don't believe there's some, you know, white guy in the sky looking down, determining whether I'm going to go up and hang out with him or go down and hang out with the devil. I just don't go there. So I, I'm, I'm so curious because I think you and I, again, are lined a little mentally about this and maybe spiritually about this. So why did you write this book? Well, I, I don't really have a particular spiritual side. I am willing to accept the uh, uh, the possibility that this reality we're experiencing now might not be the be-all and end-all of reality. And there's a lot of really fascinating stuff going on in physics, for example, and quantum mechanics and, and stuff sort of challenging some of our, our notions living on this one uh planet as one type of animal but uh i was always interested going back to my parents who were non-believers uh in uh in atheism and i i felt there hadn't there hadn't really been a a good history of it and and i love in when doing history i love to go back to the very beginning <laughs> So when I when I did a history of communications, you know, I'm talking about uh, stone tablets and and the early writing and how language started. Uh, when I did a history of journalism, I was talking about town criers and and I, I I did anthropological research. And when I did a history of atheism, you know, I went back to uh, anthropology 
and found, you know, found stories of the guy who, uh, you know, when the wizard made some red fluid come out of some poor woman's stomach, found where he got the color red and mixed up the stuff that he made spurt out. And, and, you know, some of the history of atheism, I find, I found very heroic. There's some great people involved, uh, Dennis Diderot, for example, and, uh, and it obviously coordinates to a large extent with the history of science. Darwin was probably did as much for non-belief as anybody in the world and was himself a non-believer. But in this country, as an atheist, there is a discrimination towards atheism. Um, and how do you feel how Christianity has moved in the evangelical movement? Um, what's yeah, your take darn. on that? Yeah, that was, uh, I think, I think it's a Mark Twain line. The more I kept improve, trying to improve things, the more it kept disimproving. Uh, but there was that, you know, but there have always been America is a very religious country, as we know, an unusually religious country. And there have been periods of revive, of religious re revival. And we did experience one of them, happened to coincide when I was trying to sell this book. But uh, but things are changing now. And, uh, and there's been a real increase in the number of people who are willing to call them admit that they don't have a belief in God in the United States. So I think it's changing among young people. And I think, I think that's great. I think people, I think we human beings have a responsibility to figure out how to make the most of our, our lives and how to do right by the planet without the crutch of thinking some big overarching uh, daddy in the sky is going to make everything right for us at some point. Good point. Um... Well, thank you for your work on that. So most recently, um, I think most recently, uh, you wrote your book about Lowell Thomas, Voice of America, Lowell Thomas and the Invention of the 20th Century Journalism. And Mitch, you, you really took this very seriously and you journeyed and traveled uh, the footsteps of Lowell Thomas to write this book. Tell us a little bit about quickly about Lowell Thomas and about the journey that you took uh, and spent those those years uh, putting together his life to write this. Well, book. the journey, I should uh, note, began with a man called Richard Moulton, Rick Moulton, who happens to be your husband. I guess you're aware of that and uh, who came to interview me once about this guy, Lowell Thomas, who I knew a little about, not a huge amount. And he got me interested and I started working with him on when he was trying to sell the idea. And then I had the great pleasure of working on documentary about Lowell Thomas and ended up selling a book about Lowell Thomas, first biography of Lowell Thomas, who was as well known as just about anybody in the United States, except for, you know, President Roosevelt and uh, and a, maybe a couple of movie stars. He he was huge in ways that no journalist today. He was probably better known in the United States than Walter Cronkite was at the height of his success. And uh, the book came out after <laughs> the age when everybody knew of him, which hurt sales. But he was a fascinating man, and he was a traveler, and I love to travel. And uh, I followed him in part with Rick uh to uh the himalayas to uh to tibet and uh followed him to arabia where he he was the one who discovered lawrence of arabia so uh it, it was a, a great adventure and and a lot of fun and he was a great spirit we disagreed politically but he was a great spirit well he sort of kept his pol politicism too a little close to his chest but for my viewers who probably are around my age, uh, you would remember the movie tone when you'd go to the movie theater and it would say, brought to you from the world, Lowell Thomas. And he would give this great, um, this great uh, film expose on what was happening around the world. 
Now, your book was a and the roadmap for Rick's film on Lowell Thomas. Now, to my viewers, that film came out in 2019 and it received critical acclaim. It was broadcast on 93% of PBS stations across the country. Now, Mitch, you collaborated and partnered with Rick on this film and you wrote the narration. You were also in the film talking about Lowell's life. So tell us a little bit about the importance of this film and why you and Rick's joined up and partnered to make this happen. What, what is the relevance of this film compared to, to teach uh, humanity today? Uh, what was the purpose? Yeah, uh, well, he kind of invented broadcast journalism. He was the first, you know, Cronkite knew that. He was Cronkite's hero. Tom Brokaw, knew, who was interviewed in our film, knew that. Dan Rather knew that. He was, he invented it on the radio. He was the biggest name in radio for decades, and certainly in radio journalism. And he uh, also... Uh, was the biggest name in uh, in newsreels, which people would see, as you were saying, in the theater every week. And, uh, and a lot of the journalism that's practiced today, also a lot of the journalism that's under attack today for some good reasons, because it's kind of stayed and, uh, uh, and, and maybe unintellectual in some way or, or shallow in some ways, but also for bad reasons, you know, this whole uh, kind of Trump-like attack on fake news and stuff. A lot of that started in the 1930s with Lowell Thomas. So I, I think the book was quite important for that reason. And, I, and certainly the documentary. Uh, which, you know, which did attract a substantial audience. And uh, I'm really proud of what Rick, uh, with some of our help, accomplished in that documentary. Well, you were really um, inspirational and so important in making that happen. Um, so how do you feel uh, journalism today? I mean, why why is there a major news network allowed to spew the, the you know, the untruths that are, that are happening across the country encouraging people to believe in things that aren't true. I don't, I'm not sure, Mitch, if that would have been allowed to happen under Eisenhower or, um, you know, even under Clinton. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if back in the day, the government would have allowed this to happen. And I'm wondering, I know freedom of speech, I get all that, but at some point, don't you think that spewing untruths Maybe there should be some regulations on that because it didn't happen under Walter Cronkite or on uh, Mr. Brinkley. Uh, they told the news as it was and you, you we all got it and it was true. It was truth. And then we all had to make our own decisions. So wh what's your feeling about that? I think the legal framework uh, on this is correct, which is there's no law against not telling the truth mm -hmm. in a newspaper or on TV or anything like that. Uh, unless you're defaming somebody, unless you're, and, and if it's a public figure, it's almost impossible to defame them. I think that's good because, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember when it was those of us on the left who were getting attacked for, you know, for criticizing the United States in Vietnam, for example. So I'm I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist on that front so that doesn't really bother me and again i'm i'm used to attacks journalists are always being attacked for something or other and I'm, and they're always bad journalists as you know as the the people on fox news were so uh that doesn't bother me that hugely what you know what does bother me and what i think we need is we need better journalism we need deeper journalism we need in more intelligent journalism and uh, we always need that and uh, uh aren't and, you impressed with our young journalists today who are just doing such a great job getting uncovering things and sharing things i, I i'm kind of blown away are, are yeah, you I'm, you feel yeah. comforted and, and by look at, great, yeah. You know, look at the world we live in, you know, with, on this little device. I can uh, find out anything that's happening anywhere in the world. And I can get, you know, it used to be to get Lowell Thomas or Walter Cronkite, I'd have to be in my house at a precise hour. Now I can, I can always find the news. 
So we're so I would say that we are a more educated populace, and and I'm glad that you're that you that you shared that with me about about fate about untruths, and and that that comforts me, and especially coming from you. Now, you and your wife Esther are world travelers. Talk to us a little bit about what you have learned because you have traveled around the world, 38 countries, and you wrote about it in Feed Magazine, Lonely Planet, and other media outlets. Talk about your 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 urge and your love of travel. With, of course, your beautiful wife, Esther, who I adore. Yeah, we were uh, we were driving through the South. There were some states I'd never been to. And I remember driving along these ridiculously long drives. Esther has a great capacity for sleeping in cars, which is useful. Uh, and I could drive forever. And I just, I love watching the road go by. I love... I love sitting in a bus going, driving through Turkey somewhere. I love, uh, you know, driving through Tibet with, you know, I love seeing other people. I love seeing how people live. I have a tendency that sometimes annoys my wife. I have a tendency to want to go to the poor areas rather than the beautiful rich areas. Cause I feel like I'm getting back in the past when I go there. And and also I'm seeing the problems that need to be dealt with in this world more clearly. But I, uh, you know, I I'm I'm alive watching. You know, in a, in a thatch roof hut uh, in Africa. I mean, that stuff gets me. And and I also think, you know, we we don't get a lot of time on this planet as as you and I are finding out. And. And I kind of, you know, we're, and we can't go anywhere else. This is kind of our cage, the earth. We're not making it to any other planets or any. So I figured I might as well explore the uh, the area that's available to me. And I'd, I'd like uh, at some point to think that I'd seen much of the world. Well, you have, and I love following um, following your travels. Um, you also are, I, I understand, and I hope I'm correct, that you are a triathlete. Yeah. Uh, well, I finally found an age group where I could do okay. But Mitch, uh, was, that's amazing. I mean, look at you. It's amazing. That's a that's a big deal. Yeah. No, it, it's been fun. Again, I was just a I was a bad athlete for most of my life, and uh, and now here's something bizarrely that I'm uh, that I'm good at, and it's uh, or okay at really, and uh, it, it's been fun. But you're doing it now. I now you moved. Uh, you have moved into into your repurposing stage from uh, a professor of journalism at NYU, uh, where you taught for many decades. You said forty seven years. So what are you working on now, Mitch? What's your what's your current repurposing project? Well, I'm currently uh, trying what for me is mostly something new. So I'm trying to do video and. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can put uh, the ideas I had, you know, more than 20 years ago in this book, The Rise of the Image, Fall of the Word, that there's a lot of untapped intellectual potential in video. I'm trying to see if I could make that happen. So I've actually done a few TikTok videos now, and I've... Uh, and I and I you know I put things up on Vimeo and I I don't know if there's really a role for this. It's not like uh, I'm getting huge audiences. It's not like writing a book was, but it's very creative. And I'm well, where, you know, where can my viewers see these videos? What's where can they go to see them? I'll put it up on the, when I post this. Where I'll give you a link to my. Right, send uh, me the link and I'll and I'll put it up yeah. when I put this on YouTube. So Mitch, yeah. uh, we're coming to the it's close to the end of our share with share with my viewers your opinion about the state of our country today. And as a world traveler, internationally acclaimed author, beloved and brilliant educator, where's our world headed? And what do you tell our children? What do you tell your grandchildren who are heading into a, into a you know, living on a planet that's heating up and um, with fascism sort of roiling around uh, the world? What, what, what is your vision and your, your wisdom? I'm an optimist and, uh, you know, which a lot of my friends find annoying <laughs> and, uh, oh, Mitch, you always think it's going to be okay. Uh, but I do. And, you know, and some of, uh, what, one of my newer friends asked me, how come, you know, where did this come from? 
And I realized it came from uh, the first uh, real trade book I wrote, uh, A History of News. And I, I was studying news in all sorts of various times. And one thing just about any time has in common is the journalism thinks the world's about to end, thinks it's the worst of times. People always think it's the worst of times. Back in the 60s, when we were having all our fun, everybody thought it was the worst of times. And there was a lot of reason for that. Assassinations, riots in the street, war in Vietnam. And, you know, there's certainly reasons for thinking things aren't great now. Uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the president before this was hardly uh, uh, good for encouraging optimism. In but what my we have now, but what we have now, is a planet that that may be unlivable for our our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. I mean, we we didn't have that back then. We had political strife and social strife, but this planet that we're living on, you're about to head into a New York summer, which is why you need to come to Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a, it's that for the state of humanity, there is this crisis that that we've that as human humans we've we're the frogs in the pot, the pot's boiling, and we're just sitting there going croak croak croak. So I want I so I know you're an optimist, and I love that about you. But this is a this this is a time of of real concern. Uh, I think it humanity. is, and, and, may, and maybe it's our time as humanity to move on. Maybe maybe it's the Earth saying, okay, we're done with you guys. You've been here for uh, for enough enough time and you've basically destroyed everything. And so you need to leave now. Maybe that's maybe that's where we're headed. But I just wanted to get your opinion about that because it's hard to be an optimist when when we're seeing that. Well, we're also seeing this incredibly rapid uh, uh, invention of electric automobiles which are spreading at a, an amazing rate. I mean, the technology is coming faster than anybody thought for helping. And I think there is an awareness in the world, obviously not enough, but I think there is that something has to be done. And, and I think it's being done. I don't think we're going to end life on this planet or human life. So your hope, your hope is like mine. It's in the youth, and I think we have a youth that is so extraordinary. And um, so your hope is in the youth, and that's sort of where I live. Well, Mitch, we're coming to the end of my show, but I want to let you know that the lightning bugs are flittering in the meadow. And um, Mitch, I'll never forget the walk when you first came up to my home, and it. We walked around the meadow and the whole meadow was alight with millions of lightning bugs. And it was just such an extraordinary magical night that I'll never forget. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to share that with my viewers that um, the lightning bugs are coming back. So you need to all get to to the, that magical place to watch them. And and for you, Mitch, that was a special day for Rick and I. And and oh, uh, certainly for me. And you, you have you one of the most beautiful houses built by rick uh and uh, and me and me and you and yes all the young stones. At the yeah, time. All those stones. yeah so yeah, but you'll I, have I, to I come you. back but i did want to let you know that the lightning bugs are on the meadow again and so mitch thanks for being on my show this was great i'm so glad my viewers got to meet you and to learn more about your life and um thanks for being with me and to my viewers I want to thank you for joining me and Mitch Stevens uh, for this half hour in this moment. Um, and uh, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next month. See you, Mitch. Thank you, Melinda. This is great. You bet, my dear. Bye-bye.